Hi, everyone, and welcome to this session of Remembering John Perakos. Very, very happy to have with us here today, Dr. Sigma Gherkin, uh, founder of Core Revolution, um, one of the early people that worked very closely with John in the development of the work, particularly internationally, long-term international teacher, and very ex experienced in many, many areas of healthcare. Hi, Sigma. Welcome. Hi, Ronil. Good to see you. Yeah, it's been so long. It was nice to just have a little catch up before. Uh, my goodness, it's been so many years. <laughs> right, yes. But at least we met in your own country, on your own continent. That's good. Yeah. It was very yeah. lucky that uh, we had you come down here and, and uh, we got to experience your, your work and your insight. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we, with being such a big year for John, he would have been 100 and it's 20 years since his passing. Um, we're curious to hear, you know, a little bit of, from you about John. I mean, how did you meet John? How did you get into the core energetic work? Yeah, I mean, I must go a little bit maybe before that because I had the luck in Germany because I'm German and lived in Germany for a long time uh, that I have been in the first movement of Gestalt and Encounter in 71 and 72. And that's when I later on also met Lohn in bioenergetics. And 76, while I was living at SLN in California, it's a therapy center that brought a lot of this human potential movement into the world. I came across the book from Ken Deichtwald, uh, Body Mind, where he describes just in a short nutshell how he worked with John and how he observed John. Yeah. And that intrigued me very much because he described the energy and since I'm also energy oriented, so that connected very much me already at that time. Yes. So and then when I returned to Europe, I did not only do groups, but I also started a publishing house for the new dimension movement, you know, yes. and that yes. then where I felt I contacted John the first time in the end of the 70s. But yep. that was also the time when Eva died. So, and he was not traveling, he was mourning. So, and he didn't think about the world, but how to find himself again, you know. Yes. So then in 81, 1981, I saw a brief note that he was giving a workshop near Munich. Yes. So, I mean, I had not time to do the workshop because I was otherwise occupied but since I live near I arranged a meeting at lunch mm. so and I came a bit early and you know we had that coffee break they had a coffee break and yeah. I luckily met him in the coffee break so and immediately he scanned me you know how he does yeah I, <laughs> I must admit I mean at that time I had long hair and I had a handmade sweater woolen sweater from my wife Cornelia with glowing red and golden stripes in it so, and my Native American brown leather pants on you know so it was not a necessarily the usual outfit that you expect from a therapist you know so I told him briefly hey I would like, I'm writing a book where I would like to combine body therapy and spirituality. And I hear that you're also interested in these topics. Would you also like to write a book on this topic for my publishing, you know? Yeah. And he said, well, I have no time right now, but meet me in an hour for lunch and write an outline of what you want from me, you know? So I always had a VW van, I had my typewriter in my van, so I was sitting for a while then in my van and wrote an outline for the book that I would imagine that yes. uh, I would write, but that he would also possibly contribute or deepen into. And so when he came then out for lunch and looked through the outline, he looked up very suspicious. <laughs> Did you do this? <laughs> exactly. He, he said, who wrote this? You know? I'll be this hippie that's sitting across from me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I said, I just wrote that in my car. No, yeah. no, no, no. Who wrote this? He said, you know, I said, John, I just did it in my car. Wow. He said, that's exactly the book I'm writing right now, you know. So and then we got uh, this hour was filled with, with just the meeting of heart and minds. 
Yeah, yeah. He was always going with his fingers over my hand and over my pants, my leather pants. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it was so such an unusual meeting, you know. Yeah. And then when the organizer of the workshop came, who became later also the organizer of first training, he said, yeah. I want this man in my training, you know. <laughs> so that's how I got to him. And that's where the enormous journey began for us and lasted until his last moment, you know, to be his student and his editor and publisher and teacher, colleague, and of course, by nature, and also friend. Mm. And possibly also the son that he never had to a certain degree, you know, so I know he always felt and you know many many of your peers have always said that as well that that was yeah. the relationship that uh, that they felt that you guys had. That's, that's true. So in that respect, uh, it yeah, it was a journey of unfolding mm. uh, as we would have been waiting for each other, you know so so. If it's okay, share a little bit more about those early days because you connected on so many different levels. And as you said, you had so many multi relationships that formed and evolved. But um, you know, how did it how did it ramp up into those things after that meeting? So you, jo you joined the training, I'm presuming. I mean, yeah, of course, he invited me to come to the training, and then I, of course, uh, asked him whether I can bring my wife, and that we came together, Cornelia and me. You know, we took the training. That was still the time when he was still with Dora, or so you know, his third wife, and that was very interesting. And since I, Cornelia and I, we already had two children, and we always had babysitter, then the children, and a small motorhome, and there was always a whole caboodle going on with us. And he loved that when we picked him up from the airport, you know, we had the kids in the car, and so we had a great time, you know, so it just was, it was very natural then. It and, yeah, and of course it could become very serious when we went into the work. So at the time of the training, 81 to 84, 85, uh, we were transitioning into more personality, but it was still there while I was his trainee. And that's where we also, uh, well, what shall I say? We respected each other in our space, you know. But then, of course, there was already the beginning. I already began in Tremont in the south of France, my international summer meetings. That's where I invited him then in 85 to come. And from then on, we had a blast every year till 2000, you know. Yes. So, and that's where it shifted then into colleague, into, uh, yeah, and then into a friendship because we spent so much time together, you know. So, yeah. and the colleague situation was peculiar because I came already from other modalities, you know. I had done Hakomi, I had done other work, and I have done years of Zen. So, um, this dynamic by energetic oriented uh, dynamic work I had a different style from the beginning and I mean you know my style and he accepted that yeah, yeah. every time when he said go out and do the teaching you do know the the session for half day yeah. and I said John I do it in my way and do it in your way you know so he trusted that and I learned in that moment, see, I wanted to know what is the energetic aspect that we want to activate and motivate in a person and how can that be reached? Yes. If it needs to be screaming and yelling, okay, but if it only needs a silent touch, then that was okay too. So yeah. that uh, was new at that time, because as you know, that time. <laughs> it was a so, lot more cathartic back then, yes. Yeah, I mean, I, I call it, it was, it were the tools of that time, you know, so that uh, we got to see that in that development and catharsis from the old Greek way as the release can also take part if you just invite somebody to put the hand there and you feel a deep sigh. <sighs> That's also cathartic. So 
But of course, in our understanding, it felt it must be loud and big and everything, you know. So until we learned, wow, what's the principle behind it that he tries to reach? Yeah. So, and I think we all move that direction. That's what I'm seeing all around the world, exactly. Yeah, that's that. As I said, that were the tools of the time. If you came up from Willem Reich, you know, you came, I mean, if you remember Willem Reich, you know, uh, that revolutionary moment in 25 when he was being psychoanalyst sitting behind the couch maybe even heading a veil between them so you can't see the therapist you know and then he sees you know that client is not breathing he's not moving you know why am i talking here you know so and he opens the curtain and presses the guy on the chest and says breathe you know so that was almost the birth of body-oriented psychotherapy. You know? so, yeah. so, of course, that guy must have been scared stiff, but that was the <laughs> beginning. Must have been the beginning of an era where people feel, "I want to invite the pulsation of life in you." You know. Yeah. So that's what I'm still looking at and calling my work. You know, the pulsation of life. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, coming from a very repressed Greek country depressed time, Germany, Reich, and so on. You wanted to expand, you know, you wanted to scream out your freedom. So there were not that many tools. The word mindfulness were just in the beginning in the Zen movement, Buddhist movement, you know. I learned it with Charlotte Selva in Essa Lane, you know, the whole uh, sensory awareness that we call now mindfulness. So I already had that in my repertoire and could bring that in. And, and that, that felt very good. That was a good addition already at that time. Mm. But what was mainly is to see the mostly unwavering vitality that John brought in, you know. That, that was and the way in the generosity that he shared that with me and also with mankind, with others, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So, and that, yeah. And of course, as you mentioned, we had so many dimensions. It almost felt like we were waiting, as I said, for each other. Because since my near-death experience that I had with five, I could also see energy when I tune in, you know, so. And I felt very, what should I say, careful about that in a therapeutic scene. So that was not a topic you very much talked about at that time. Sure. Even, even with near-death experience, we had no idea how to deal with that, you know, and uh, so that we opened up more, much more later, you know, and that when that became clear that we both can see, then ah, we had so much to talk, you know, so much to share, yeah. sitting just in landscape, looking at the pulsation of, of trees, of animals, and of course of people, you know, and later on, we did that in, in in the Mediterranean when we were lying on the beach and so on. I mean, I remember you reached me in a time right now where my son asked me that he wants to scan all my photos because he feared, hey, when this guy is gone, I don't know anymore where his pictures are. So I had the last couple of days and weeks, I've gone through thousands of pictures where I finally also saw from our group, from John and everything, you know, and yeah. I found a picture where we were sitting on the beach and doing with his goggles and with his aura goggles, you know. Oh, yeah. Yes, <laughs> so that's so wonderful. We were, it, we had a blast, you know, we were doing research on the beach and exploring and so, so much connected us on that level, you know, and so every you. time since I was very connected in Europe, uh, I was also invited to conferences. So I, of course, gave him the room to present. And uh, then we mostly combined it with seeing researchers or other people that he was also interested in. So the other part was the curiosity that was still there, the aliveness, you know, that was still there. You know. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes he described it in some of the trainings always when he left Greece, you know, as a 12 or 14 year old, you know, when he 
saw the hills and the sea and the goats and the sheep, you know, making love or whatever, you know, so, <laughs> or copulating better word. <laughs> so that he, he still kept that uh, uh, in his mind and that that where he felt people unite, you know, on that level. And that's where he was also so intrigued by William Reich, of course. So in, when he brought that in as a sign of aliveness, you know. So the body, sexuality, and of course, later than also the hunger for spirituality uh, was something that he felt driven by and that we connected in, but we connected also much beyond that, you know, much beyond that. I can see so, that. There was yeah. that uh, I, I can see how you both uh, encouraged and, and brought out more from each other in the working together. Yeah, unless I let him sleep when I picked him up from the airport, we were chatting all the time, you know. There was so much to share professionally yeah. as well as personally, you know. Yeah, yeah. So since we both had so many experience in the field, you know. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I don't know even where to where to begin. So with a summary in terms, maybe if I stay with that, you know, in the south of France. That, of course, was almost a highlight in Europe, you know, for 15 years, you know. Wow, Many 15 years. People, 15 years, we did every year. I mean, I do it now the 35th year, I'm keeping it going. Yeah. But we did every year for 15 years, you know, and that was pretty highlight in Europe because a lot of professionals came, you know. Also yeah. some who became later leaders in co-energetic also came to us and from there, joined as a trainee in their country and so on. But since he was also famous in the field, of course, he was John Piracos, you know, and so he attracted also strong egos, you know, who wanted to work with that special famous man. <laughs> so the first day was always very dear, you know, but very hard. And he fired it up with an intensity, you know, that you just melted the ego you know so and you felt safe to do so that's the thing i mean i have been in workshops where i felt over the first day oh my gosh i hope that will work out for most people because in that cathartic movement for me i could take it some people got lost you know so and we gotta recognize that too but with him he could fire up an intensity and give a ground of safety you know I mean, you know that. So I remember that big manager who invited me later for a business workshop and so on, but he complained because he couldn't get an individual room anymore and all these kind of things because we were between 50 and 80 people, you know? So, and on the second night, he just took the mattress out on the veranda and slept outside, you know? So, <laughs> and he felt so good, you know? So next morning he was, because he was sleeping in front of my door, you know, I said, hey, what are you doing? I said, hey, I just wanted to sleep in the open sky. And we had a great chat and went to breakfast barefoot. So he let go immediately, you know? So that was the thing the transformation that we could see every time and every time yeah. and that was yeah. not just co-energetic that was John that was John because yeah. other people did bioenergetic and it did not transform you know that it, it was more therapy it was more clinical mm -hmm. but there was another dimension that came in with him mm -hmm. so and that what people felt you know it so was not so much the technique I understand. And I mean, that's one of the lasting messages that I got from John when he when he said to me that he said, look, you know, it's that connection. It's seeing the person, the techniques will come. Yeah. This is what shifts. So I'm really, really, now that you've brought that up, I'm keen to get what you saw and felt of John that created that, that really helped people to, to take it to the, you know, the next dimension. Uh there is something that is unseen and cannot really be taught. <laughs> so I already knew that from my first teacher, Jiddu Krishnamurti, you know, oh, yeah. who 
always said change now but he didn't give us tools how to change and where to change and what to change because the message was there's no way that i can tell you how to change but of course that's what also made me a therapist because i wanted to develop tools to want find the ways and of course bioenergetic gives you very clear tools and down to earth whether you call it co-energetic or whatever john was doing bioenergetics you know so that was very clear but that was the tool that was a technique but there was something else flowing into it mm. and that was something to be learned and you could almost get that by osmosis you could almost or unless see my intention was i want to learn that i can explain it that was my um yeah my vision that i felt i would like to as a leader i want to and as a teacher in the future i want to explain this principle mm -hmm. and that's what i bring into my training so that still sometimes when people look at the literature list the therapist and say why is there a book about krishna muti or why is there a zen teaching in it so because i said yeah because therapeutic techniques you can just go somewhere and learn the technique but where you bring your heart your mind your flow understanding of nature and the pulsation in that's already i think what john connected with willem reich you know because if you read and i read reich and i have my half meter of reich still standing in the shelf there you know so if you read him and what he calls orgastic potency of course when you only think sexually you feel oh wow he means great sex no in orgastic potency is the capacity to pulsate with the origin of life and that what connected them and that what connected us you know and i think that's where i learned uh, a lot you know that's being 20 years and with him uh, there was always an exchange on that level and of course in the early something was there what john described as his hunger for spirituality when he worked in bioenergetics and that's where he met eva you know but we never practiced anything of that so then people still went off and did then and cornetetics or did this and that and all of a sudden people had their spiritual practice outside of the therapeutic work so then in the early 90s i also started another institute the institute for energy and consciousness in which i uh, invited then and worked with Zen masters and Sufi teachers, Native Americans and shamans and scientists and so on. And he was always interested. He said, what are you doing there? So really, and I explained it to him. You know? <laughs> so I said, I let them do the work for two and a half days, what they do, pure Zen, we do pure Sufi work. And then I integrate for two and a half work with body oriented and mindfulness centered psychotherapy, you know. And then we can exactly see what works and what doesn't work and that not all work can be the same it's a personality that you take it in i have a preference for that i react to this so one thing one method cannot do it all for a person where we are of such expanded nature you know so and that's where i want to meet you i want to meet you without it any preconception of course yeah we give our work a name you know so as i said my other institute is energy and consciousness so they left it open but co-evolution is a therapeutic training piece so you give it a name but at the end is and that what connected us to see in my near death experience i came back and made a commitment to bring light into people's body of course with 5e i didn't know what that meant you know so and nevertheless i followed that whole path every time you know in my whole life in my upbringing and when i met john and later also in the certification uh 
it was just where we just, I will not say explode, but we dissolved into light. And Thank you. I was really feeling, feeling it as you were yeah. speaking. It's so beautiful. Mm. Ah. If I may, from this such very personal space, and thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah. What are some of those more personal memories, the unique Sigma John memories that you have, the one, maybe some of the more fun ones that maybe weren't work, because obviously you had so much fun in your interests. I shouldn't even call it work. It was your interest. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you have another hour, so okay. <laughs> I have so, as much time as you so, can give me, my friend. <laughs> it's, it's so numerous, you know. I mean, beginning with the goggles that I just showed you on the beach and all the people in the restaurant, you know. <laughs> okay, what are these guys doing? You know? <laughs> and, but, and other things, you know, just going to a French restaurant, you know, eating raw food, you know, uh, in San Francisco or going to a ballet because he loves ballet. And then it turns out, you know, that Eva had been a dancer originally. And I don't know whether you know the story where Eva told him, well, I know you from before. And he thought, of course, from a lifetime. And she said, no, no, Look, you came to my dance studio and wanted some lessons, but you're not a good dancer. <laughs> so I think he took one or two lessons, was embarrassed and didn't come back again. And he said, I never realized that was Eva, you know, so. <laughs> where, was the, uh, where was Eva's dance studio at that time? In New York. So that was in New York. Yeah. Right. So that was <laughs> so that was such a beautiful story. So he loved ballet, you know. But then also, as I said, mostly after the workshop in France, we had a week together. Every day was going down with the family, you know, and he loved to have family around him. That was missing for him, I guess, you know, live in peace and and of course having fresh fish in the evening the sunset or driving into saint tropez we both love shirts you know ah oh, we looked at shirt shops and went shopping <laughs> it was there were just two pals going out for shirt shopping you know so that was felt so natural and in the next morning we were again the therapist in the group and he was a main leader and uh we could shift the roles and just accept each other, you know. So I, I remember the one moment, it was very early in our times where we had a convention in Munich and then we had another one in Switzerland. And we were always driving, you know, sometimes six hours, sometimes even 10 hours, you know. So, and sometimes he woke up and said, where am I? California, France, Italy. I never know with you when I wake up where we are, you know. <laughs> Because we were so much together and sharing. Yeah. And then everything was for booked. Yeah. And, and it was a great hotel, you know, five-star hotel. And they said, sorry, we have no room available. So I tapped him on the shoulder and said, hey, John, I'm young enough. I can sleep in my car, you know. So, And then that guy at the foyer said, well, there is a couch in the room. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he looked at me, I looked at him, you know, we nodded and so off we went. So now that's where also eased our situation with each other, you know. So to be able, you know, to open up in that moment and meet the, meet the possibility. And that's what I always found wherever we went in the world, you know. So, yeah, he had some trepidation sometimes with some people with some movements, but he was always able to meet uh, people and see who they are. And is there anything I can contribute, you know? So that, that would be, and of course, on the other note, more on a serious note, I felt very, that I could one more time 
bring his original family together, you know. So his early Greek wife, his daughter, so and his second daughter lived in San Francisco and he never told me. So when I heard about it, I had to confront him about that, knowing, hey, you are the world's greatest therapist and there's one shadow still that we need to confront. I mean, by the time I was developed enough and our contact was deep enough so I, I could do that. And he said, you know what? Yeah, that is a shadow. I don't know how I can do that alone. So I said, hey, I come with you. We go together. So, and that was so beautiful then, you know, so that opened up his heart and brought a closure to the separation that he had caused in being with Eva, you know. Yeah. So in, in that one, um, so did you say one of his daughters was in San Francisco and the other one was New York? Well, in New York, right. Yeah. 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 And so yeah. You were able to help to bring them all and have some sort of closure. That, you know, so mm. if you would have had already the term positive psychology, so that would have been something that John could have contributed to. So unfortunately, he was so focused on the negativity to get that out, you know. So and that we also had to learn that just that hope or that wish that if we open up the negativity, the beauty will come by itself. That is what we did not practice anymore. I mean, that way that we have no time for that. People got to do that. We got to focus on what they need to learn and to change. And I said, but people have to learn, you know, out of the goodness that is there, the core, the essence that he's always talking about. How yeah. can we practice that? Yes. That was that there are other tools, you know, so that was not available at that time. And that's where we come in and contribute and continue. Well, it's the evolution of the evolutionary process, isn't it? That's see, my private practice was always called co evolution. Yes. And he always said, I like that, but I feel now locked in with the trademark and so on. I cannot change it anymore. So he very much liked it, you know, that I was focusing on the evolutionary path, especially also later on when after his departure, when things became difficult. Uh, and I mean, there were so many upheavals, like when a good master goes, there are always sometimes upheavals, you know. And I didn't want to get involved into all this. I wanted to continue my work. And it was not easy to let a name and work and complete unity go that you had built up for 20 years and just continue to walk along, you know, and build a new world movement, you know, but uh, that what he did too. And he yeah. moved from right, he moved on. So, but there was that loyalty that connected us, you know, so, and that was, and that was very interesting. Uh, sometimes you talk in therapy and teach our father transference and so on. I know I didn't have that. I had a loving father, not very conscious, but very loving. But John was very clearly the transference of my grandfather, you know, See. because my grandfather saw me in a silent way. So I never really interfered in the education, but I felt very seen by him. Gotcha. Yeah, and that's what I felt with John, you know, so that being seen and with that feeling totally, I'm here, I'm here with you, you know, and that what we gave each other. So, and yeah, I mean, it's priceless, you know, when I go through all these moments, you know, so in that respect, yeah, I mean, so many moments that I would come up with John. Um, see, when he got interested, he was always interested into the research of the energy, as you know, you know. But at that time, like many people of the time, it was anecdotal, you know. You saw things, there were no devices, how did you measure it? You could only see it personally, 
he sat down and wrote down how fast a tree is pulsating. But what if you don't see that, then you can say, mm -hmm, okay, I got to believe you, but <laughs> that's not research, you know? So yeah. in that respect, so when I came up with infrared or first with uh, Kirlian diagnostics, you know, and with that, uh, I had so many connections with researchers that I brought him in connection then with two, you know, with Stanley Crippen and Valerie Hunt and Tiller and Healers and so on. He was so excited about that, you know. So when we went there, you know, and even though he said, well, I don't have the time and the means anymore to really go into science, you know, I mean, because now these days you got to show up facts. You got to, you cannot just talk energy anymore. You know, people will immediately ask, you know, what does it mean in terms of neuroscience? What does it mean in terms of physics? What does it mean in quantum physics? And so on and so on. And I personally love that. And I am a different generation. I still had the time to delve into it, you know, so in that respect, Back to that is where I said, where we come in and continue. See, every 15 to 20 years, therapy has to change because society is changing. We need to evolve into not what the market needs, but where the people are. Because I think that to a certain degree, when we look at young people and so on, yeah, they're becoming more emotionally cautious. We can see that. But on the other hand, we must have done something right because they grow up with more consciousness. They grow up bright. They are interested in topics. So what I see now after COVID, there is a certain caution in terms of emotional sharing that you see um, a, more among young people, especially in the Western world. I don't see it so much in South America or in the Eastern world. They are still hungry for new beginnings, you know. So, and that I think in two, three years, especially now after COVID, there will be a great hunger and demand for trusted emotional work again. That's not necessarily based on, on blowing the energy out, but integrating the dynamic of life with the energy, you know, of the body and the emotions. And we are very, well prepared for that with the work that we come from you know yes and that's where i feel the gift that he gave us you know so uh, yeah so beautiful so look i'm uh you know i really appreciate you sharing so much of yourself and of your beautiful relationship with john you know for today's session and you know what i'm going to take you up because i want to come back for some more there's more things we need mm -hmm. to we need to talk about but for today's session is there um, anything from John, any message, any memory, any insight that you could share with all of us uh, as a part? Yeah, because one thing is uh, the deep union that was also possible, you know, when I, I found this one again, you know, so if you see this, you know, yeah. so that was the moment that we connected in. From that place, then we could do any theoretical therapy. And I would complete with his own words, you know, I yearn to see corn energetic blossom in many more ways in order to help unify the split between psychology, religion, science, and personal life. My work is to reach the depths of a person's entity to help that person open up and transform. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's a legacy. <laughs> it is right yeah so let's continue that vision and bring it out in our own qualities you and yours that only Ranil can do I that Sigmar can do and many others who have been in that path you know so beautiful people so the seeds that he threw out that that flowers and goes into the world thank you so much Dr. Gaskin, once again, <laughs> your time. We will chat some more, and um, I'm I'm looking forward to our next episode and what more things we can be talking about. Maybe I can tell you to next week. I maybe tell you I have a lecture at the USABP, and then you get more about.
what the work is about and what we can do. That would be wonderful. And All you right. can go on YouTube and see the other work and see the other lectures, right? Yeah. Of course. Hey, from my heart to all the people out there so that the work continues and I wish you all well and celebrate life would John would say you know celebrate life thank you Sigma. have a great day